Remember, Chandrayaan-3 had, uh, had three primary objectives. The first one was to demonstrate safe and soft landing on the lunar surface. Second was to demonstrate the rover roving on the moon. And the third was to conduct in situ scientific experiments. While the first two objectives have been achieved with success, making India the first nation in the world to successfully land on the south pole of the moon, it is the third objective which is now of interest to the scientific community. And even on that front, Chandrayaan-3 has started delivering data that is being collected by the lander and the rover. As for the latest updates, Chandrayaan-3's lander has profiled the lunar temperature. This is the first time that a temperature profiling of the soil at the lunar south pole has been conducted. And India, of course, is responsible for the same. We have with us Group Captain V. N. Jha and Mr. Shijin Pal as well. Mr. Suresh Nayak also joins us on the broadcast. Uh, on your screens, of course, is this uh, lunar temperature chart that has been put out by ISRO. I also have it on our touchpads, but let's keep what we have on our screens right now. Group Captain V. N. Jha, uh, if you can just help explain to our viewers, so we've put out the chart that was uh, presented on ISRO's Twitter saying variation of temperature on lunar surface with an increase in depth. So it's gone the, uh, you know, the payload on the lander, which was supposed to conduct this experiment, it's gone below the surface about 10 centimeters under the surface and it's of course also taken the temperature at surface and little above surface. What do you make of the findings sir? If we were to talk about the temperature that you find at the lunar south pole, the surface, how crucial is this finding? Thank you very much Devka and to all your viewers and thank you News X for taking up the cause of science for the benefit of the entire uh, science levels of the nation. Look, what you see here in the chart is the plain, simple, raw data from one single source. And that single source is one of the uh, sensors, we call it chase, mounted onto the lander that is giving this particular data. It is only telling you what is the temperature at various places. Remember? Uh, the temperature on the moon's surface varies anything from in the night uh, about minus 233-235 degrees Celsius. In the daytime, uh, in the mid midday or uh, you know the past midday, to about 125 degrees Celsius. That's the range that the temperature varies. Uh, on the uh, southern pole of the moon, we don't show the data is not there. So this is the first data which has come. We must also so sorry, sorry to interrupt you there, sir. I'll allow you to complete. But you said that um, it was the data from the north pole that you were just explaining. The range ha, that you just ha, explained. Ha. The ha. range that you just explained. No, that's around the equator. That is the American studies and the uh, Russian studies as well as the Chinese studies. They have uh, uh, made us known, the entire world known, and uh, they have given their data that the temperature varies on the lunar surface in and around the equator that they have landed. Okay. To that minus uh, 233 degree in the nighttime uh, to about 125 degrees Celsius in the daytime. So that's the range of temperature variation. Now we must and and what chart you are showing is on the southern pole, you know, at 69 degree, 69.4 degree uh, south that we are talking of. You must also remember, this is still morning on the lunar uh, uh, area where our lander has landed there. It has gone through the night part when the temperature must have gone in the vicinity. I cannot say that uh, it would have been exactly minus 233 in the southern pole also, but by and large, the surface temperature is around that in the uh, night time. So from that minus 200 uh, and, and, and uh, lesser uh, spectrum in the night, it has come now in the morning. It is not yet come to the uh, um, uh, afternoon. Mm -hmm. It is only today, I think, is the uh, fifth day of the morning, fourth or fifth day of the morning on the lunar uh, uh, surface. It is their beginning of their entire day journey. And in that day journey, it is only fourth day or fifth day of the Earth's day, uh, which has to be about 14th day in the entire spectrum of the day there. 
So maybe around sixth or seventh day of Earth, it will be the afternoon there. And as we know that on any summer or on any afternoon here on the uh, Earth's surface also, the temperature shoots up to the uh, maximum only post midday. It is around one o'clock or two o'clock, you know, a couple of hours after the afternoon, the midday, hmm. that the temperature is maximum. So you can expect, we can expect the similar thing there on the moon surface also, but there are variations. You know, there are many variables should come into play and this data, what it is picking, uh, what it is giving is only purely temperature without any other variables in the vicinity. It is showing the surface temperature and it is showing the temperature about uh, say 8 uh, centimeter, 80 millimeter uh, underneath the surface. We should also remember that uh, the, the rock of the moon, even the rock of the earth is largely uh, uh, non-conductive. So what is there on the surface and what is underneath, it is non-conductive. Hello, I am not getting audio huh? from the speaker. So, so uh, uh, that conduction doesn't take place. So, in that case, now the data that has come, it has to be seen in the perspective of the entire thing that will take place. The variables, it is the beginning of the day, the moon has gone through from the minimum temperature of minus 230 odd uh, in the night time to now it will go on the plus side and it is going on the plus side, 50 odd degrees Celsius it is showing in the, on the surface. So, okay. So that is what right now we are seeing. Chest equipment will give us the temperature mapping in and around the surface. So At that the is what. Time, Group Captain Jha, are we expecting the findings then to be very similar to what was found, say, in the northern side of the moon or closer to the equator of the moon? It could be. It could be. Uh, except the equator. Equator has got large area where where the entire surface is exposed to the direct sunlight. Uh, in the, of the afternoon, you know, so at, at 90 degree, vis a vis, it comes at a slant onto the uh, pole. Both the poles, it comes at a slant. So temperature variation in the daytime will be slightly less. The maximum what is on the surface about 125 degrees Celsius. It will be less here in this case. But other things, by and large, we should expect the uh, similar things. But it is only the beginning of the experiment. We are right now talking of a single parameter that we are seeing. Uh, expect, uh, do expect in the coming days that many such surprises will come and the newer version of the scientific facts on the lunar surface will emerge before us. That we will have to debate about it. Okay, let me bring in Mr. Srijan Pal as well. Uh, Mr. Pal, what do you make of these findings? Also keeping in mind the fact that there, there have been several people who've wanted to now explore the idea of humans one day colonizing the moon, colonizing Mars. When we get information such as this, as far as the, you know, something as basic as what is the temperature that you're looking at, what does this mean for some future aspirations? Well, uh, we did expect that the moon will have uh, severe temperature variations over short distances. And as uh, now when we are seeing this data, actually, what we predicted, this is even more severe. So uh, the typical variation which we would have expected from surface to a depth of about uh, 10 centimeters would have been about 30 degrees. It turns out to be six. Yeah, it mute. Uh, okay. So now imagine if you were living on the moon, your head would be at the temperature of 50 degrees and your feet. Uh, just a minute, right? it is getting muted. Your, Mr. Your Nayak, Mr. Nayak, can you hear me? Sorry, Mr. Junpa, let me quickly fix Mr. Nayak's connection. Mr. Nayak, can you hear me? But I should get the audio. Okay, I believe uh, Mr. All right, I believe Mr. Suresh Nayak is having some trouble hearing us there. So we'll try to quickly sort that uh, issue out. And Mr. Shijan Pal, bringing you back into the conversation. So my apologies for interrupting you there. Uh, but no if problem, you can just, just continue show that. Sometimes technology, you know, we are able to communicate. Yes, with technology the puts us on the moon, sir, but technology also then disrupts yes. the conversation about the moon. But yes, no, no, go no, ahead, no. please. So that's what it is. So I was just telling you, imagine that you were sitting on the moon or standing on it. Your head would be at a temperature of 70 degrees and your feet would be almost at a temperature of minus 10 degrees. So a lot of summer clothing here and a lot of winter clothing on your feet. That is the complexity of living on a planet which is not Earth. 
there will be severe temperature shocks and we expected it it's not something which we didn't know we are well sort of averse with any planet which has no atmosphere would face a similar problem also look at the challenge which uh, the vikram lander had imagine the temperature shock just you see that graph and it spikes up suddenly you know towards it towards the height so as you go up the surface you know above 0 degree above the 0 uh, meters it spikes the temperature spikes so imagine when vikram lander was coming down it would have been experiencing a temperature of perhaps 100 degree centigrade as it is landing and the moment it lands the temperature falls to zero and probably goes even lower than that so imagine the engineering marvel which pragyan rover and uh, our uh, vikram lander are there you know and they're facing all this and they are working there one very interesting finding which has happened uh, i think today only you know, so a few hours ago is that our pragyan rover managed to cross its first major obstacle which was like a hurdle so it is like a hurdle race so yes. our first hurdle of about 100 mm which is about 10 cm is what it managed to cross now this is very it sounds easy on earth because the center of gravity is you know it balanced on earth the, the gravity is higher on moon you're sort of semi floating and with that 1/6 of gravity the pragyan rover is a small device it's only about a meter tall actually less than that the weighs 26 kilograms on earth weighs which would feel like uh, about 4 kilograms on moon and yet it is able to cross the barrier so that is the marvel of india's engineering now what does it mean for future moon livers and i think somebody who is going to live on moon is already amongst us some child perhaps what it would mean is that when we start living on the moon one of the critical challenges would be to create the atmosphere and that has to be done to create that atmosphere the way to go about it would be to release the frozen gases which are on the lunar surface which means we have to heat which means we need a fuel which means we need either and the most likely fuel is water so you take water hydrogen and oxygen split it break it back again and then you get the fuel and the by product of that is water again so you have to find water and that's the race for water it's not just about people drinking water it's also about the fuel which will heat up the lunar surface release the gases those gases will form the atmosphere that will balance out the temperature it will be more like earth it will never be like earth earth is a beautiful planet and we are born out of it but moon can be made to be livable so that is the lesson which we need to look at moon and till then is in a in a spirit of a joke if you're a fashion designer and listening to this remember on moon you need to have a summer clothing at the top and a winter clothing at the bottom that's how it's going to be till we find a way to balance the temperature with the atmosphere absolutely that's that's a very good way of putting it group captain vn ja before we move on to some of our other uh, experiments that we'll be discussing shortly just you know I'd like your perspective also sir on this aspect like i said there have been aspirations in the past uh, expressed very clearly that uh, one day there will be humans on moon there will be humans on mars but as we get more and more data from the research that is being done what really is the possibility do you feel that the moon can ever be inhabited by uh, humans look uh, me you and ashwin uh, you know we are all free to have our own imaginations in the coming days, coming weeks, coming months, uh, the data which is coming out from the uh, Southern Pole uh, needs to be looked at and looked at in the totality. You know, uh, looking separately in the isolations in a tight uh, you know, box, uh, uh, you know, that may not serve the purpose. So, in that, we will have to look into uh, all together. Uh, every variable has to be brought into the focus to even analyze those data. So these are the beginnings, how the how the life will sustain there, you know, the Earth, the moon's gravity is one sixth, whether even if we intend to create some sort of environment there, will that uh, the molecules of the air or the water vapor or oxygen or nitrogen, whatever it is there, will the gravity one sixth of Earth be able to hold the the atmospheric pressure, whatever the lake is there, to the surface, you know, this has to be seen because just just beyond the surface, there is a zero pressure. So, the, the entire vacuum of the space 
which is zero gravity, zero zero uh, atmospheric pressure. There is no pressure in that. Uh, there is no air uh, in the in the uh, entire universe. So when it is directly faced, the lunar surface is faced to the vacuum of the uh, uh, cosmos of the space. Any gas that you create, you know, it will gradually it will just go out of it and it will be sucked out. Uh, in the process that the moon goes around the earth and the earth goes around the sun in that entire pathway that small amount of gases will get lost so it's a very tricky situation right now we are you know welcome to think our own line that you know head mm -hmm. will be uh, uh, with a, a, some sort of um, uh, garment which is cool so which cools us leg will be with a garment which heats us you can always have a thought process of this but when it comes to the uh, the life support there needs to be a very robust life support on the moon. You know, uh, you know. I had uh, written a book for the uh, ISRO uh, uh, in the beginning uh, uh, years. This is uh, the uh, the yes. It's called design, des design concepts in human space missions. Sure. So, what human space mission does is it as at least as a uh, crew model in which which is close from the all sides. You only create uh, having that uh, artificial atmosphere, gases, uh, either you push it there or suck out the carbon dioxide, water vapor and so on. That is in the small space. But what happens on the moon, which is absolutely open on the all sides, and moon is not small, it's huge. So, so how do you create atmosphere? These are the areas of imagination. Someone will have to think about it on the, of the hat, of the, you know, you can have any type of imaginations that you can think of you have to create there may have to be a cave which is enclosed from outside in within which you can create a, some sort of gas where you can live because even for you to live you need uh, pressure you need atmospheric uh, atmospheric pressures of the uh, value of at least if not more at least uh, uh, half of the earth at least seven psi or pressure is required there to live for, uh, for you to live uh, with, with some sort of safety, it is not complete safe. So there is a huge problem of the life support. So in the coming days, we can think of that whether the uh, human will go to the moon, whether that could be become that could become a platform for further launch into the deeper uh, uh, deep uh, space exploration. Yes, these are all areas to ponder about. But right now, be prepared to face those data coming out from the lander and the rover, which is telling us what is existence in and around that the lander sees that the uh, rover does. So be prepared for that and grasp those data and see in the totality. Don't be isolated. One small data has come, one parameter has come, so look from the microscope, that would be, that may not be correct approach to it. Absolutely. And I'm just going to take a moment now uh, to also bring in some other aspects because even as ISRO is unraveling the secrets of the moon, the space agency is now all set to discover what more secrets the sun holds. The sun, of course, <laughs> is the closest star to Earth and it is little explored. India has undertaken this mission with the objective to better understand the upper atmospheric dynamics of the sun. Apart from this, ISRO aims to identify the sequence of processes at multiple layers of the sun and also observe the in-situ particle and plasma environment. I'm talking about the Aditya L1 mission that ISRO is set to launch in just a few days from now tentatively. In particular, diagnostics of temperature, velocity and density by the seven payloads will be in focus as far as Aditya L1 is concerned. I'm just going to put out uh, this uh, brochure that has been put out by ISRO on our screens if I can and I'll take this conversation forward with Mr. Suresh Nayak. Mr. Nayak, we're talking now about the Aditya L1 mission, which is the first Indian space-based observatory class solar mission to unlock the mysteries of the sun. If you can begin, sir, by explaining to our viewers what an observatory class solar mission really is. Yeah, actually, uh, you see, uh, for example, Hubble telescope, the uh, observatory in space where uh, it can... Uh, uh, look uh, near the space, I mean, towards the space, and uh, it has got uh, enough uh, capability to uh, see the objects, celestial objects, 
too far away and clearly because the stars emit uh, two types of radiation one is uh, the light and another is the radio uh, waves and uh, the uh, telescopes on the observatory in space they should be capable and should have enough high sensitivity to pick up these uh, signals and interpret uh, by the scientists so that is actually the space observatory hmm. now you are talking about uh, general uh, this thing uh, we are you asking me about uh, uh, adityayan 1 yes, l1 yes yes aditya l1 which is uh, looking to cover a distance of 1.5 million kilometers from the earth it says it's about four times farther uh, then the moon and i'll just come to some of the other interesting aspects as well so this is of course the deployed view that uh, israel has put out in its brochure and this is the stored view of aditya l1 uh, what i'd like to understand mr nayak is this concept of the lag range points uh, if you can just help explain our, to our viewers because the word l1 in fact comes from this concept of a lag range point yeah you see lag range point is a point where the gravitation uh, forces of uh, sun and earth are balanced out and uh, therefore the satellite can fairly stay stable there uh, since there are no uh, gravitation forces substantially acting on it and therefore there are two advantages one is uh, uh, it gets uh, all continuously all the time the view of uh, sun hmm. and secondly uh, there is no question of eclipses there since uh, it is uh, uh, you know there is no chance of uh, earth coming in between the satellite and sun because always uh, the satellite is in between earth and sun so these are the two advantages of uh, uh, lagrange point of earth and sun and that to l1 is a very uh, you know vintage point since uh, it is uh, closer to sun that mm -hmm. much and uh, that way it will be able to detect uh, the basically the temperature data and all those things coming from sun and uh, secondly uh, this uh, uh, rotation period of the satellite around the earth is same as the rotation period of the earth around moon that is 365 days yes so it gives an advantage which i mentioned earlier that is the uh, the best uh, point to study a, you know the solar system i mean not solar system but the sun and uh, we are now concentrating uh, in this uh, mission to few aspects one is you know, there is a corona around the sun which of course we can't see during the uh, you know light i mean at daytime only uh, during the eclipse we can see that and uh, there is a, that is a interesting part of the study where the center of the uh, sun the temperature and the temperature in the corona region there is a lot of difference the corona temperature is extremely high uh, you know because always there are uh, nuclear uh, uh, reactions are taking place and it generates very high temperature and uh, we are trying to find out the more in depth the reasons for this so that is uh, one of the most important things second thing is uh, we are trying to uh, we are going to study uh, the effects of the solar radiation on the earth's atmosphere for example uh, because of the solar radiation coming from sun towards earth there can be disruptions in the communication systems on earth yes. so we want to exactly find out the mechanism and uh, this will help us in future if uh, this kind of phenomena takes place okay. and how to really overcome that 
Okay, Mr. Shrijan Pal, let me bring you into the conversation as well. I just, um, I've put out the trajectory for Aditya L1 for our viewers on the screens. Uh, and I'm not going to pretend to be a scientist here. So if you can just help explain. We're looking at uh, a few phases here. So of course, uh, w from what I can understand is that it will be firstly launched by the PSLV from the Satish Dhawan Space Center. Then it will initially be placed in the low Earth orbit. And subsequently, this orbit will be made more elliptical and later the spacecraft will be launched towards the Lagrange Point 1 using onboard propulsion. So if you can just help explain this to our viewers, sir, if it says, of course, uh, as the spacecraft uh, travels towards L1, it will exit the Earth's uh, gravitational sphere of influence, uh, so on and so forth. But I've put out uh, this sort of, a, uh, you know, just the trajectory that has been explained by ISRO in their brochure. So it launches from the Earth and then we see that it's once again taking those elliptical rounds as we had seen with Chandrayaan as well. That's, that's the method that we follow as far as ISRO is concerned. And then it takes a very interesting trajectory where it's, uh, you know, making a lot of unique shapes. Uh, and then it goes towards this lag range point one, uh, where it then goes back into a halo sphere around this particular point. Right. So it's an interesting trajectory, as you rightly pointed out, strange shapes. But do understand that this is a two dimensional representation. The uh, actual orbit is a three dimensional space. You know, yes. moving at some of those things which look funny are actually movements along the Z axis, you know, the depth axis, which you can't see on a screen. Which is yes. two dimensional. Uh, the launch is similar. It's similar to what, say, uh, you know, initially it is similar to what Chandrayaan did, right? So we, we go into the lower Earth orbit, we stabilize ourselves there. And then we keep uh, boosting the uh, the system to reach to increase the electrical orbit till a point when you know in this case in the last case it was the Earth and the Moon and we were trying to balance between the Earth and the Moon's gravity. This time we're going to play between the Earth and the Sun. Now the Sun is a much bigger body compared to Earth. It is about three hundred thousand times massier, bigger than the Earth itself. So which means that the Sun's gravity is also far higher compared to Earth. What you do is that. You, you increase the, uh, the, the, the orbit of our Aditya L1. Our Aditya L1 will go to a point where you can see, I don't know whether you can see the colors on the screen, but eventually, you know, it reaches into the cruise phase, which is that funny shape which you're seeing. Yeah, and yes. It, it this is dark blue shape right here. Which yeah, it's a dark blue, yes. exactly. So I was not sure whether seeing the colors on the screen. Are we seeing the same colors? This is what I meant. So the dark blue shape is when it, it goes into the cruise phase. And then it establishes somewhere in the L1, around the L1 point, which is the long range point, which you said. At this point, this, this, this distance is about 1.5 million kilometers, which is about 1% of the distance of the Earth from the Sun. So the Sun is about 150 million kilometers away from Earth. We are at 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth towards the Sun. Which means at this point, the gravity of the Sun, which is far bigger compared to Earth, would be more or less equal to the gravity of the Earth experienced there. Mm. And that's that's the stable point around which it will keep going on. And that's the uh, the halo orbit insertion, which you're seeing the green one, you know, and then it goes around that. At this point, as uh, you know, someone was already explaining what all we will do. Interesting finding, but I want to bring in something very interesting and I want to take you back in history just to explain the significance of uh, Aditya L1 mission. And I want to take you back to September the 1st, 1859. And this is something called the Carrington event. And suddenly the miners, uh, you know, the people with mining, they were, they were suddenly saw great light in the sky, in just early morning hours, great light. And they thought it's, it's morning is already there. But it was actually a solar flare, a solar storm, which had converted into a magnetic storm on the earth. And the telegraph wires uh, caught fire, you know, all over, Many, many countries suffered and a lot of property was lost. But that was at a time when there were no electrical wires, there were not much electronics. Electronics didn't exist actually. But imagine if the same character event were to happen today, when a massive solar storm uh, translates, a solar flare translates into a geomagnetic storm on Earth. We are relying on electronics from our mobile phone to this connection which we are doing to the television you are seeing this on. Everything is electronic and electronics are affected by magnetic storms. So it's very important for us to study these magnetic storms and uh, well, we can't control them right now, but at least it will be as big as, you know, creating an earthquake warning system. So we'll be able to at least create that. Now, not, nothing as big as the Carrington event has happened since, but uh, the sun is unpredictable. And I also, also want to, yes. to 
the uh, issue and if you give me 30 seconds because uh, you were yes, 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 on uh, other planets and Dr. Cha was speaking about it. I thought, sir, we have to be a little more optimistic. There are obviously challenges, but challenges were there to cross the oceans. We work with, uh, I run a center for astrobiology, United Kingdom Center of Astrobiology. We work with them. We do a lot of experiments. I've written books with Dr. Kalam with the optimism that we will someday definitely live on another planet. Yeah. Now, there may be many ways to do it. Some may work, some may not work. But uh, I'm pretty sure that in the next 30, 40 years, uh, somebody will be living there. Maybe a permanent colony, maybe a temporary space where we can go and come back. Mm -hmm. I have to be more optimistic about it. It's humanity's ultimate quest to live on the moon and many other planets. And I'm 100% sure that this will happen and we'll make it happen. Absolutely. Let me give the last word to Group Captain V N Jha as well. Group Captain Jha, of course, uh, as we inch closer to the launch of Aditya L1, uh, we're expecting, of course, all our scientists to be with us on a daily basis. There's so much to discuss and explore. But I just have a simple question that I'd like to end this conversation on. I am currently showing some of the payloads on Aditya L1. And a question that keeps arising online is, what really is this reflective material that is used to cover all of this, we saw it on the payloads of Chandrayaan uh, as well, of the Chandrayaan 3 mission, the lander and the rover. And we of course now see this uh, golden material covering all the payloads as far as Aditya L1 is also concerned. If you can just help quickly explain to our viewers, I have a minute left. Well, I'll just uh, briefly mention to you what we have seen on the Chandrayaan. See, we are the foils, we are the gold uh, plated foils or gold foils, which prevent uh, the minor uh, particles charged particles, I'm talking about the alpha particles or maybe, uh, you know, uh, other electron particles from penetrating through and through and damaging our sensors. Our sensors, which were sensors, are working on the, uh, on the charged particles, on the, on the, on the type of uh, that, uh, uh, that is going to be seen. Those are going to be affected by these. So these immediately block those small charged particles and also the sun ray, when it you know comes directly there, it could be reflected from there. So these are the few reflective measures, uh, adaptive measures, protective measures given onto these small charge particles for the you know reflector uh, reflector sheet that we are seeing on top of it. That is the major part of it. But it never protects. You know, I was I was on, on the day when the uh, uh, Chandrayaan was heading towards moon. I was I had told you that in the universe, in the deep space, there are cosmic radiations, there are uh, galactic radiations, uh, the neutrons of which, the protons of which, are, are alpha particles of which, has got such a huge amount of uh, velocity that can penetrate through and through the entire system. And in the process, damaging some of those, uh, you know, micro circuits that we may have. So it has got that much of capability when we are talking of those yes. uh, galactic radiations or the cosmic radiations. But solar radiations are slightly more considerate. Uh, they can they can withstand this sort of a sheet. So major part of it can be reflected so as to protect our sensors, which are mounted uh, in those uh, very sensitive equipment. Thank you so much, sir. I wish we had more time. Like I said, uh, the time is always less to have these discussions, but we'll con continue to have more and more of these. And of course, as we were speaking, some more information has come in of how the Aditya L1 launch is scheduled for the 2nd of September at 11.50 a.m. IST from Sri Harikota, as we've mentioned earlier as well. But uh, with that information, we leave it there. Uh, and we thank all of our scientists for joining us for that very interesting conversation on both the Chandrayaan as well as Aditya L1. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.